Hi everybody! Welcome back to another episode of The Nav's Effect. I'm your host, Naveen Ganglani. And joining me today is my good friend, of course, Mr. Joseph Gerald Javier, also known as Celtics Manila on Twitter. Big time NBA fan. And as you can probably see, he's wearing a Celtics t-shirt. So, we're going to talk about the Celtics 76er series and a little bit of F1. But before we get there, I first want to thank the sponsors of the podcast. First of all, Bex with Betting. If you're looking for a place for the best odds to bet on the NBA playoffs and parlays, of course, check them out. Thank you as well to our sponsors, Get Blued and Green Blooded. If you're looking for Ateneo and De La Salle, merchandise, apparel, gear for the UAP games, or just volleyball, basketball, whatever it might be, check those shops out. Okay, so Joseph, I have a story for you. Uh, about 30 minutes ago, I'd like to say. So my wife, you know, she's painting, having a nice, quiet afternoon. Um, you know, my sa labas, buksan yung aircon, right? All of that. So she's painting, having a coffee, then she comes out and she hears, she hears someone at home screaming. That is absolutely ridiculous. And so she goes out and goes to the person, which I mean, I guess you all figured out by now is me. And she's like, are you talking to yourself? And I'm like, was I? I guess I was. And that's probably because Joe Mazula made one of the dumbest mistakes I have ever seen, or at least for this playoffs, rather. Look, I'm going to get right to it. I thought it was a mistake not to call timeout in overtime. Now, regulation, I'm kind of fine with it. Towards the end, you go for the kill, you go for the final shot, you don't let the defense set up. Because even if you miss, which Marcus Smart ends up doing, you at least still go to overtime and give yourself a chance to win. But then there are about 16 seconds left. James Harden hits a three-pointer. Big mistake by Jalen Brown, in my opinion. Hits a three-pointer. Philadelphia goes up by one. There are about 16 seconds, 17 seconds left, yeah. and you have two timeouts if you're Boston there, right? Now, Joe Mazzulla doesn't call a timeout. Boston runs their play, albeit a little delayed with some procrastination. Marcus Smart gets a three off. The problem is after it was 0. 0.0 seconds left. Shot goes in, but doesn't count because time yeah. expired. But you have two timeouts. You're down by one. And my thinking there is, okay, the shot went in, but that's not the decision I'd like to see my head coach make. I mean... You let the clock run down, then you're going all of, all for nothing, right? You go for the win at the buzzer. You try to escape there with a win, or you go back home disappointed. But with two timeouts, if you call it one timeout, you advance the ball. Okay, let's say you make a shot. I mean, let's say even if the defense can't set up, but you make a shot, you go back on top, they get another chance, you get one more stop, you win. But here's the key there. If you miss a shot, after you call a timeout, you foul, other team makes one or two free throws, you still give yourself the chance to win or tie the contest after that. So, as someone who's followed this team, the Celtics, what were your thoughts about it? Because I've read a lot about how Joe Mazzulla's coaching has been a topic of interest for the Celtics fans this season. Yeah, I totally understand the frustration and I get why most fans are you know, really pissed about it. But they got the play that they wanted because uh, they want to put Tatum on a matchup that is very favorable to favorable to him, which is uh, to put him away uh, outside Tobaris and get Maxi on defending Tatum. Okay. Um, so that's why they didn't call a timeout. And I think they already drew it up uh, prior to the uh, last uh, dead ball. So they got the, the matchup that they wanted. And I think uh, the only problem here is they ran it too late. If we have 0.2 seconds, we could have won the game and we would call Joe Mazula genius. Right? <laughs> that's how it <laughs> I goes. I mean, yeah. that's, that's how it goes. It's a gamble. And I also noticed that they already knew what play they were running because uh, Grant, I think I saw him on sidelines trying to say to Tatum, run the play, run the play. He was motioning because yeah. uh, Tatum started to pick up his dribble around like five seconds left. Correct, correct. Yeah. So when Joe Mazzulli said in the post game that uh, we just lack pace and uh, he wished uh, that they have run the, the place much sooner, they have that yep. play in their pockets. That's why they didn't call the timeout. Yeah, also, but Gina, yeah, just to add to that too, I think Philly knowing that Tatum going late also kind of allowed them to be like, all right, yeah, let's pack the paint because if he makes a pass in the last second and that takes away time from the clock, which might lessen the chances of getting a shot up in time, which happened to be the case. I think they didn't anticipate that, that James Harden will make that three-point shot. The corner because three. They, they, yeah, because they were up by one. Right, yeah. If they only made uh, a two-pointer there, no, they will they were still up, run the they were up. They were up by two, right? Boston before Harden shot. Oh, you're talking about yeah. after Harden shot. 
Yeah, after the Harden shot. Harden shot. Yeah. Yeah. They already knew what play they were running. So I think they just rolled with it. And I also understand the argument that if you don't see them, you know, running uh, the pace that you wanted, then you can call a timeout. I also agree with that. And I also agree with their decision not to call a timeout right there because if you think about it, just 0.2 seconds late, the shot went in. <laughs> Are you looking for a betting platform with zero restrictions and where you can buy crypto using PHP directly? Look no further than Dexwin. The platform is designed to make it easy for you to buy and sell your favorite cryptocurrencies using Philippine pesos with low fees and a user-friendly interface. But that's not all. Dexwin also offers you the opportunity to bet on your favorite NBA games and superstars in the playoffs and mix and match parlays to win big. Whether you're a seasoned sports better or just starting out, they have everything you need to make the most of your wagers. And with their instant withdrawals, you can quickly and easily get your money when you need it. When you're withdrawing your winnings from sports betting, they make it fast and easy. So what are you waiting for? Join Dexwin today and start taking advantage of all the benefits they have to offer. I guess I would have been more okay with it too if there wasn't a situation in regular regulation where you did exactly the same thing, not call a timeout, and you end up missing the shot. Now, it was also a relatively good shot, semi-contested mm. three-pointer for Marcus Smart. And I agree with you that if there's like an extra 0.3 seconds on the clock, you know, the, the yeah. conversation is very different, right? I just don't know. I think I think over the years we've seen the smart coaches just know when to call a timeout in that situation. Yeah. And maybe that's because these smarter coaches know that they have an after timeout play that they can actually just take out from their back pocket and get the basket out of it. It's just tough because Boston could have really ended the series today, right? Yeah, and yeah, true. Maybe that, that's partly why everyone's going to dissect things. And speaking of dissecting certain plays, uh, Jalen Brown's decision to double team in the yeah, that that fight, was bad. That, that was, was bad. Really bad. And, and to be fair to Jalen, he took accountability after the contest, saying it was a bad decision in his part. But you know, I, I guess we have to talk about it. You're down, you're up two at that point, and beat yeah. that statement in the post. So it's a little bit of a mismatch. Although I would trust J- Jason to hold his ground there. But two ties the game, a three gives Philadelphia the lead. And you're leaving James Harden wide open. And not James Harden from games two or three where he's struggling to shoot from the field. You're leaving James Harden having his best game of the playoffs wide open in the short corner to take the lead. And lo and behold, that's what happens. Philadelphia takes the lead and they run away with the win. Yeah, I got to give it to James Harden as well. I mean, he answered the call, right? So uh, the online community is mocking him left and right. (laughs) <laughs> After those two bad games, and uh, he answered the call today. He played magnificent. I mean, what the hell? I mean, what can you do if it's if it's that on fire? You know. I mean, but I will say this: um, as much as I love Jalen Brown, that is uh, one of his main weaknesses. His decision making. Uh, decision making. Whenever he's an off ball def- defender. Um, I actually it reminded me of uh, the play back in the bubble where we left OG Aninobi for a buzzer beater. Yes, yes. That yes. was also uh, off uh, Jalen Brown. Jalen, yeah. So I, I mean, if you're up to I maybe I'm thinking too much. Maybe Jalen Brown just didn't know they were up to. <laughs> right, so right. If you're if you're up to, you don't help off shooters. Just right. stay okay. home. Or it's an instinctive play where as a basketball player, you just see the chance to double team, maybe force a turnover. And it's like your bo- something just takes over and you go for it. You know, credit to Embiid as well. That was a difficult pass to make. Yes. I mean, he's turning around and at that point, you're thinking, okay, I got a score here. But then he probably sees Harden in the corner of his eye wide open and delivers a pass. It wasn't on point. Harden had to go down a little bit to receive it. But still, just to make that pass for his size, given all the work he did and by the way, Embiid was spectacular as well. Just to look at the numbers here, James Harden, 42 points, 8 rebounds, 9 assists, 4 steals, only 1 turnover, 16 of 23 from the field, including 6 of 9 from the from beyond long range. And then Joel Embiid, 34 points, 13 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 turnovers, 11 of 26. So Philly kind of made him struggle from the field, but he went to the free throw line 15 times, including that one trip in overtime, which you know was a tough call to kind of swallow probably. 12 of 15 from the free throw line. That call, by the way, I felt like that was a little bit of a makeup for the charge on Marcus Smart, the one that took place just a little bit beforehand. Yeah. And yeah, and if you're Boston, Tatum struggles in the first half, gets it going in the second half. 
you suddenly make a bunch of shots down the stretch. I just feel like if you're a Celtics fan, that's really a difficult loss to consume right now. LaSalle fans and Animo supporters, this is your best shot to secure the most incredible DLSU merchandise in the market through Green Blooded. From 12 midnight until 5 a.m. on May 5, Green Blooded will have a sale on Shopee where certain shirts can be purchased at the affordable price of only 55 pesos. But that's not all. From now until May 9, you can purchase the best Green Blooded shirts for only 250 pesos. Buy collared shirts or hoodies while getting a 100 peso discount and secure vouchers plus other goodies. Amazing, right? So what are you waiting for? Visit Green Blooded on Shopee now and show off your animal spirit. I'm not as down as most fans. Uh, to be quite honest, I mean, we played three bad quarters. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. we played one good quarter and we're 0.2 seconds away from stealing the game. And I think this is the best punch that Philly can give us. Mm-hmm. And if this is the best game that you can play against this uh, Celtics team and you just won by a fraction of a second, then I don't know. I'm going back home. I'm, I'll be feeling a, a bit uh, good going back to uh, Boston. Yeah, because it's a best of three now. And I was reading a stat somewhere. I think MB has only won once in yeah. the playoffs against Boston. Until today, I think this was only one out second of second. Ten, I think. Uh, one out of ten. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, if you're Boston, this is a best of three now. You have two games at home. I'm curious though. Compared to last season's team, how much trust do you have in the Celtics team? Because when I look at it just from a from the names in the paper perspective, right? You kind of argue there's more talent with the season's roster mm-hmm. because White, I believe, is better than he was last season, at least more consistent. And then Malcolm Brogdon coming off the bench is just a weapon that really no other team that remains in the NBA playoffs has. Uh, and Robert Williams only played 14 minutes. And I think that reliance on Williams compared to last season is less now, which yeah. is a good thing because uh, the guy's made out of what? Um, break, breakable cardboard or something yeah, like that? Yeah, uh, his knees are made of paper mache. I mean, paper. <laughs> exactly. So, how much do you trust the Celtics team compared to last season? And of course, I think it's also worth noting that even if they were both first time coaches, I just feel like Yudoka had a better feel. For what to do with this team compared to Missoula does? I think there's an argument that uh, uh, Yudoka has a better feel of the team because he's more of a, a player's coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, Joe Missoula is more subdued. So that's mm-hmm. why he doesn't you know, try to uh, make himself uh, relatable to the players, especially in post-games. I mean, every <laughs> time you read his post-games uh, interviews, it, it doesn't tell if he loves his players or not you know he doesn't point fingers or not but with Some, Yudoka he will tell you right away yeah he sucked <laughs> sometimes sometimes I wonder if Mazula is like just angry at chewing gums because of how intense he is when it comes to chewing his gums and post game pressers and during the games yeah but, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I trust this team uh, I think uh, this year's team is much a better bounce back team compared to last year's mm-hmm. mainly only because of the we- uh, we have additional weapons this year. Uh, we have uh, Derek White, who's really uh, put himself in the team now. Um, he knows how to play with these uh, uh, guys. And Malcolm Brogdon as well. Uh, thank God that we have Malcolm Brogdon. Um, I think uh, him and Marcus Smart really uh, kept us like right there in the uh, behind the Sixers. Like uh, They gave us a, a punching chance to, uh, to keep the, the game alive in the third quarter. So, um, also with the veteran um, presence in the team, uh, we have Malcolm Brogdon now. I am Blake Griffin, even though he's not playing, is giving a very good, uh, you know, vibes within the team. So, um, I think they're a much in a better headspace in this season compared to last year. So, I, I'm I'm still confident that they can, you know, come back and uh, maybe win the, the next two games. And, but, and this one in six. Yeah, it feels like Boston is the better team. Kind of gives the vibes of last year's Boston-Miami series also where overall Boston just had more talent. But then they're just so prone to self-inflicted mistakes that even if you know you feel like they have a series under control, they tend to let opponents back in. 
And that was the case in the final, right? They were up 2-1 against Golden State. Golden State comes back with a counter, and Boston really never recovers from that the rest of the way. I still, I kind of still think Boston has the most talent, and at their best, it's the best team in the East. It's just, I feel like there's a weakness there when it comes to coaching. And that's not to say that Missoula is a bad coach. It just is probably like an observation that when it comes to situational decisions, even if it seems like he's not out there like hurting the team, it doesn't always feel like his decisions are what's best for the team. Or is that too much of an outsider's perspective? Um, I think it's a valid opinion. But you know, let's not forget that he's just a first-year coach. <laughs> He's just a first-year coach mm. and he's a last-minute replacement. And for that kind of situation, he's really doing well. Okay, let's fast forward. Let's see what happens in the postseason with the Celtics. But if I'm Brad Stevens, I, I, maybe I'll try to hire another like veteran coach that can give another... Like know. an assistant. Like kind of what like um Alvin Gentry was to Steve Kerr when Steve Kerr yeah. started with the Warriors. Yeah, I saw Paul Silas, the former coach of uh, Houston Rockets, hanging out with Brad Stevens back in... Stephen Silas? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, Stephen yeah. Silas. Sorry, Paul Silas. Rest in peace, Paul Silas. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. But yeah, Stephen Silas was hang- hanging out with Brad Stevens back in game two, I think. So um, maybe the decision to upgrade the coaching staff is there. We also lost Damon Stadelmeyer. Yes, yes. Um, so we're one man down in the coaching staff. But yeah, um, the criticisms regarding with the Boston coaching is uh, is valid. And I, I totally understand where they're coming from. And they could have called the timeout there. Yes, I totally agree. Maybe, but if Horford made the shot in the corner, it, it was happening. That was another one too, yeah. yeah. And they yeah. don't miss a free throw. One free throw. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he also had some good looks. I, that that shot that he that was an offensive foul on Maxi. I I have to kind of yeah. say that it, it was. Yes, it was an offensive foul. I agree, but Maxi didn't sell it. You, yeah, you need to sell, sell it. it. That's sell why it. drawing an offensive foul is an art. It's a skill. Exactly. It's a skill. Exactly. And sometimes just being tougher and like stronger doesn't really help you there, right? Just being, yeah. I mean, look at MB. The guy just flails around, gets 15 free throws, and a bus win playoff game. Uh, but, okay, before we leave the NBA discussion right now, just some quick thoughts on the other series. Let's start with um Phoenix versus Denver, the other game we saw today. How do you feel about that? The UAP is back for its second semester sports. Make sure to check out Get Blued for all your staple Team Ateneo gear. And of course, for your Men's Basketball Championship shirt in case you haven't gotten it yet. Visit Get Blued on social media and their stores at Shopee Mall and Laz Mall. And remember, always buy original. Man, um, I really thought that Denver could end this series in five, but I was totally mm. wrong. I mean... But I mean, and, what you gonna do when Landry Shamit turns into Reggie Miller in the fourth quarter? Yes, he's averaging three point five points in the whole series. He didn't I mean, play one of the games, even I think, right? They benched him in one of the games. I think so. I think so too. But I mean, he averaged three point five points in the series, and then suddenly he's Reggie Miller in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, and then uh, De- Devin Booker, fourteen of eighteen from the field, twelve assists, thirty six points, six rebounds. Just in- incredible. Uh, I think Denver played uh, the game for them to win, but you know, uh, this is the beauty of the playoffs. Yes. You will see some unsung heroes. <laughs> so yeah. it's the, it, it will be known as the Landry Shamit game. So, <laughs> yeah, what what I found interesting is you know so many people have said so far, hey, Denver is the Deepest team, one of the deepest teams, right, in the NBA because of especially after how they went up 2 0. But I'm looking at the stats right now, and legit only seven guys played for Denver. And then you go down Phoenix, let's see, one, two, at least nine players, nine players played at least 17 minutes. Meanwhile, for Denver, you got seven guys who played at least 20 minutes. The eighth guy who played was Braun, who played only eight minutes and was a minus 10 in those eight minutes. I'm not really sure Denver is as deep as people think because obviously Jokic is great. Murray is great. Porter, when he's not taking bad shots, he's good too. Then Gordon, Caldwell Pope. 
Then you got Jeff Green and Brown off the bench. But other than that, it's like a whole lot of nothing. Thomas Bryant, Reggie Jackson aren't giving them anything right now. Uh, Lakers, Warriors, quick thoughts. Okay, this is very interesting. Uh, I think this will be a very long series. Seven uh, games? Yeah, it will go to seven games. And maybe Warriors in seven. But um, I really like the adjustments that the Lakers uh, uh, had in game three. Um, they just put Bando on Curry and Curry suddenly stopped becoming himself. So it was really interesting to watch. But, yeah. you know, knowing Golden State, you know, they love to play ropa dope. And you, you think that, okay, we got them this time, right? We got them this time, and then they will come back uh, harder. So uh, I really think this would be a very long series. Right. Now, I thought game two, game three rather flipped when at the beginning, ha- Coach Ham kind of had Davis playing like a drop on these pick and rolls and you got Steph going, you got Clay going, you got Poole going. Then towards the second quarter, there was a shift where you had Davis kind of leveling in the screen in the pick and roll. And all that lent his ability to cover space, go out uh, to help and then recover back to the paint. His ability to just change games defensively was the difference in game three. So I'm curious to see what kind of adjustments Golden State will make in game four to deal with that. And I felt like once the Lakers got off to a lead, Russell was hot, LeBron was getting in transition, uh, Schroeder was making jump shots. You know, think they just started getting going, and from there, it just kind of ballooned. So I'm curious to see how the Warriors respond. What do you think about Heat Knicks? Who would you rather face in the conference finals if the Celtics make it? I initially thought that Knicks would advance, but I really want, in my heart, I want Miami to advance. Mm. I want to run it back in the ACL. <laughs> I want to run it back. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. yeah, I'm really surprised the way how uh, how poorly the Knicks are playing in the second round. Um, right. I honestly thought that uh, Knicks have enough personnel to stop Miami, but you know, I think Spo uh, uh, is out coaching tips right now, so mm. I'm I'm really surprised by that. But I really want Miami to advance, to be honest. <laughs> I, I think a Boston Miami part three would be quite something. Yeah, uh, well, we're currently one one, right? Yep, yep. Uh, twenty twenty <laughs> conference finals, Heat win in six. Twenty twenty two Celtics in seven. Both in the Eastern Conference Finals. So that would be quite the series, I would say. And what's interesting is, is in the bubble, it's neutral ground, no home court advantage. And last season, Miami had home court advantage, and now Boston will have home court advantage in a hypothetical matchup. But of course, it's too early. Think about early. those things. 2-2, Boston, Philadelphia, 2-1, Miami over the Knicks. After this is posted, we'll probably already know who, uh, how that series is. So let's check it out. But let's kind of shift gears to F1 here because we've had five races in the 2023 season. And so far, the winners have all been from Red Bull. Max has won three races, including the recent Miami GP. Paris won two races. So it's been Red Bull domination. Their engine, their speed, it's better than anyone else in the grid. And this is probably how it was during those years where Mercedes dominated the competition with Lewis yeah. and then Rosberg and then eventually with Lewis and then Bottas. But it's, it's starting to feel like a little bit of a bore. Now, the races can still be interesting, especially when you take note that Alonso and um, Aston Martin is competitive every week. It's just tough because it feels inevitable. Like today... It was an exciting race, right? Because Max starts number nine in the grid. Checo starts number one. And no have... safety car, no DNF as well. So it, yeah. just, it was really boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nothing. Nothing like that. And Max just was like, okay, who am I going to overtake now? You? Okay, got you. You? Okay, got you. You? And then eventually he just overtakes Checo. And then if you're hoping for some excitement, you're thinking, hey, maybe Checo versus Max could be this every week thing, this race-by-race race thing, and it will be like Rosberg versus Hamilton yeah, yeah. from all those years ago. But then today, it's like Max is over to Checo with East, no problem at all. And I'm thinking, well, this just feels like a, an inevitable Verstappen third championship. Yeah. Sadly, it's true. I mean, if there's one word that can describe Verstappen in the last two years, it's really inevitable. Inevitable, yes. Yeah. Yes. Too bad. I mean, um, I'm just really hoping that. Uh, no, I'm not hoping. <laughs> I'll just crush my hopes right now. 
right now just uh, a Mercedes as a Mercedes fan I'm just hoping we get the number two constructors uh, championship. Right. So right, I think right. I heard that after Imola uh, GP which is next week uh, they will uh, introduce some huge mechanical changes so whether right. it's uh, changes with the uh, side pods or whatever but um we'll see after Imola GP um if uh, Mercedes can you know uh, present a um a better, you know, uh, pace, especially against Aston Martin. I mean, they've, they've been really great. But um, Lance Stroll, oh my God! I mean, he's still not in shape. I mean, just uh, Fernando Alonso. Just he said, "I'm being uh, on the podium is very lonely because <laughs> I think he's kind of subtweeting Lance Stroll that mm-hmm, he's not mm-hmm. uh, be- that behind uh, in the in the grid." So we'll see. We'll see. Right, exactly. And uh, to be fair, also, Lewis and George Russell seem to be in good spirits after the race, right? Yeah. And I guess they're happy with the car improving week by week. But you're right. Let's see how it goes in Imola, which is on May 21, I believe. Yeah, May 21, Sunday. It's been a weird F1 schedule to start the season. Yeah. Like we went a whole month, the whole April without a race, right? It was like a one-month break a few weeks into the season. But we're getting a lot of races now. We have one on the 21st and we'll have another one on the 28th. And hopefully Mercedes can kind of like make things competitive because the championship race, like you're, we're talking about Lewis and Max here, like Max is almost double Lewis in the driver's championship race. And Red Bull is just absolutely decimating the competition when it comes to the constructors championship. And I always think back to what Horner said in one of the drive to survive seasons where he's like, okay, Toto has always had the, the liberty or rather the privilege to be the principal of a team which has had a good car that just blows the competition mm-hmm. away. Well, now he is on the other side of that. You know, Toto yeah. is trying to be the principal of a car uh, and a team that is not as fast as Ferrari, not as fast as Red Bull, not as fast as Art Aston Martin even. So maybe those similar changes that they've been discussing will kind of alter how races go because it's honestly just kind of like a... Sleep fest <laughs> nowadays, yeah. and especially if you have to wake up at 3 30 a.m. here in Manila to watch a race. I mean, you don't exactly just want to watch Max or Check or Cruz at the finish line unless you're a Red Bull fan or unless you're betting on Red Bull, which right now seems to be easy money. Let's see, because I feel like the season has kind of lacked the dramatics or the fun, the overtaking, the unpredictability that was apparent two seasons ago, was constant every week. You kind of saw it in glimpses last season, although it had more to do with Ferrari's ineptitude, which, by the way, has kind of carried over to the season. <laughs> do you still have hope for this 2023 season, or are we just kind of staying tuned for who comes up in second place? For me, there's no hope. Uh, if you're looking <laughs> for a, uh, you know, to get the the championship, uh, we're just fighting for the second place at this at this point. Even the drivers, I mean, I, I really think that Max will just, you know, uh, take it away. Uh, from here, I mean, this is the chance that Checo could have, you know, established himself like a legit threat to Max, but it didn't happen today or in the last race. Exactly. Well, anyway, I thought that was a good conversation. Let's see how the rest of the F one races go. Hopefully, it gets more competitive because it's it's a fun sport. I'm really enjoying it. I just wish it wasn't like an easy Verstappen win every single Sunday. But hey, Joseph, thanks a lot for joining me, man. And looking forward to see how the rest of the NBA playoffs go as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks, guys.